crisis. I'll ask the clerk to read the motion. That this assembly recognises the unprecedented impact the COVID-19 global pandemic is having on our society and economy, commends the invaluable contribution made by our frontline workers who have provided vital service selflessly throughout this pandemic, believes that a fair and just economic recovery strategy is required in the aftermath of this crisis, agrees that an economic recovery strategy must not only recognise but also demonstrate that we value our frontline workers and want to protect them and the most vulnerable through any impending recession, understands that workers' rights and public services must be protected and commits to existing economic challenges being tackled by a just transition to a more highly skilled, regionally balanced and sustainable economy, which works for workers, their families and businesses, and calls on the Executive to ensure that these principles underpin an economic and society-wide recovery. Thank you. And I now call Kiva Archibald to formally indicate that she's moving the motion. Moved. The Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have 10 minutes to propose and a further 10 minutes to wind. One amendment has been selected and is published in the Marshall List. Uh, and I invite you to please open the motion. Um, over the past few weeks, we've heard many people express sentiments about how we need to do things different in the future, about learning the lessons of this pandemic and valuing the key workers who've stepped up in the most difficult circumstances and done more than just their jobs to serve wider society. However, if we want things to be different, we have to take action to make them different. We cannot simply rebuild what was there and return to business as usual. We must here and now plan for the economic and societal recovery we want to see and put a strategy in place to action it. COVID-19 has had a huge impact on our society and economy. Our budget was already under pressure prior to this unprecedented crisis and our public service is struggling after a decade of austerity. Those challenges remain and we must all collectively continue to make the argument for investment in our public services. The outworking of this crisis must not be further austerity measures from the British Government to pay for it and we should all be making the argument for economic stimulus. Otherwise, the interventions to date will have been in vain and we will see escalating unemployment, economic stagnation and greater inequalities. Frankly, business as usual will not be good enough. It will be a return to an economy based on inequality, where the rich stay rich and the poor stay poor, with ingrained structural barriers across all facets of society. We must break down those barriers so everyone has the opportunity to achieve and prosper in life. This pandemic has changed things. For many, it has changed how we value and appreciate the small things that we may have taken for granted. Seeing our families, going for a drink with friends, training with our teams. It has changed things on a bigger scale too, how we work, transport choices, supply chain decisions, and there is of course much still to be worked out about how things will operate as we reopen our economy and society. Our strategy for recovery must not just be about making things better for the economy, but for society as a whole and also for our planet. I previously said our economic and societal recovery should be based on some core principles. Those principles, in my view, should be a just transition to a net zero carbon society, supporting workers and families, and supporting businesses to create and sustain employment. We are all aware, aware, well aware at this stage of the need to rapidly decarbonise to limit global warming to less than 1.5 degrees in order to prevent further climate breakdown. A green recovery has huge potential to create high-skilled, well-played employment through green skills development and infrastructure investment. There have been increasing calls over recent weeks from across the world as well as here locally last week when 40 organisations wrote to the First Ministers for a green recovery to be prioritised. At the weekend, the Director General of the WHO urged us to combat climate change and environmental destruction with the same seriousness with which we are now fighting COVID-19. I am therefore calling for the establishment of a Just Transition Commission to bring together all relevant partners to plan for how we achieve our climate targets and ambitions as a society. A Green New Deal was a commitment in New Decade New Approach, which needs to be implemented as part of the recovery plan. A Green New Deal can stimulate economic activity by rapidly switching to green energy, growing the green economy, building modern public transport infrastructure and retrofitting homes to conserve energy, among other things. To support workers and families, we must address the long-standing issues in the local labour market, and in particular the scourge of low pay and low productivity. 
Low pay causes in-work poverty and leaves families in danger of deprivation. Commitments in New Decade New Approach provide a basis for tackling this. Powers to set minimum wage levels should be made a devolved matter, and we must strive to replace precarious work with high skills, secure, unionised employment. This will go some way to addressing long-standing low productivity levels. Strengthening collective bargaining through the recognition of unions in, workplace, in the workplace is also important to empower workers. Our communities have played a huge role throughout this crisis, supporting each other and the vulnerable. Other business models, such as social enterprises and cooperatives, bring important benefits to communities, including investment. We should seek to build in the community solidarity that has been shown over recent weeks. While we will always look outwards and to achieve globally, we must also support our Indigenous SMEs and micro-businesses to create and sustain employment. There is a need to review the remit of InvestNI to support the de development and diversification of local and all-island supply chains, empower micro-businesses and entrepreneurs, and realise the potential of the digital and green economies. Go ahead. I've listened to the member now, and there's a question that keeps occurring during all that she said. Who's going to pay for all of this? And she talks about an economic stimulus. These are all great words. The party opposite can't even support a north-south interconnector, which has benefits, strains that I, from a unionist perspective, would have support for that. But yet, when it comes to a beneficial connection between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, the party opposite can't support it. So fine words are all fine, but who is going to pay for the wish list that she's setting before us this afternoon? Uh, I thank the member for his intervention, and I think, to be fair to him, that is a, a, an issue that governments across the world are grappling with at this particular moment in time, and we all have to look about how we are going to do it in the future. So I think that collectively there is a need to address that. <clears throat> While we will always look outwards and to achieve globally, we must also support our indigenous. Oh, sorry, I already said that. Um, such a strategy should develop high-skilled employment in sectors that will help us to achieve our economic potential, fulfil our climate obligations, and shield the economy against further COVID-type shocks. Crucially, we must also invest in inter 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 apprenticeships and further in higher education to ensure that people have accessible opportunities to reskill and seize emerging opportunities. Despite the efforts to limit the economic damage through interventions, including the job retention scheme and business support grants, there is a recognition that unemployment figures will likely soar in the weeks and months ahead. We must have a collaborative approach to respond to this, involving government, industry, education and the community and voluntary sector. Indeed, the engagement forum established by the Executive in response to the COVID-19 crisis is a model of engagement and partnership which must be encouraged to continue. The involvement of wider civic society, not just as stakeholders but as partners, will enable policy to be shaped to best respond to the needs of society as a whole. The Executive will need tools to aid the type of economic recovery to which we aspire. My party colleague, the Finance Minister, has previously spoken of establishing a commission to evaluate the devolution of fiscal powers. This should be taken forward as part of the recovery planning, and we must also look at the type of borrowing powers that we can deploy. The economic and societal recovery post-COVID-19 must seek to address the fundamental underlying problems of the Northern economy. We must address the impact of the COVID-19 crisis and confront the severe economic threat of climate breakdown, and also prepare for the very significant challenges posed by Brexit. In doing so, we must seek to advance the objectives of social and economic equality, sustainable economic development, regional balance and the protection of workers' rights and incomes. To quote the Director General of the WHO again, decisions made in the coming months and implemented can lock in economic development pa patterns that will do permanent and escalating damage, or if they're wisely taken, can promote a healthier, fairer, fairer and greener world. Therefore, I urge members to support the motion, and we will also be supporting the amendment put forward by the Alliance Party. And can I call and Andrew Muir to formally move the amendment? Uh, I beg to move Amendment 1. Thank you. And you will have 10 minutes to propose the amendment and a further five minutes to wind all other speakers in this debate with a five minutes 
And unfortunately, I'll not be able to call everyone who's indicated they wish to speak, given the limitation on our time. So I now invite Andrew Moore to open the debate on the amendment. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to thank our frontline workers and to speak on how specifically we can build a more inclusive, just and prosperous future out of the crisis that we currently face. To that end, I think our proposed amendment enhances this motion, and I hope members will agree to support it today. And I thank uh, Dr Archibald for the support given. I think 2020 will be one of those iconic years etched into our memories, as well as the history books. It is the end of one era and the beginning of a new, which is perhaps why January feels such a long time ago. Economic orthodoxy has been turned on its head, and the necessity of protecting our people, health service and economy has required all of us to make sacrifices unknown in peacetime. Our frontline workers have helped keep our society running, from the doctors and nurses in our hospitals to carers in the community and supermarket workers keeping the shelves stacked, and it falls to everyone to ensure that they are valued and cared for. Sadly, I think most will agree that a reception, and perhaps a severe one, is impending. Although it may not be somewhat inevitable, its full impact is not. People are facing uncertain times, and we must ensure that we protect the most vulnerable. We cannot allow the weight of the economic troubles fall upon them. The cost of this must be shared out fairly through progressive taxation, ensuring that nobody is able to avoid their obligations by sending profits overseas. So right now, we are at a pivot point in history, and we should be looking to our future aspirations for both our economy and society. In doing so, we must ensure that development is both green and sustainable, as well as structurally inclusive and fair, which our amendment speaks to today. Mr Deputy Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic has understandably been at the forefront of our minds in the past few months, but we must not forget the ongoing global and accidental crisis of climate change and environmental pollution. The momental increases in air quality and falls in CO2 emissions that we have seen as a result of lockdown have only drawn greater attention to the remarkable health impacts of pollution. Indeed, it is estimated that across Europe, around 11,000 lives have been saved by the reductions in nitrogen dioxide in the air. We have also seen a boom in active travel. I have never seen so many people in my life out on bicycles and walking and all sorts of things over the last number of months. And that, again, not only represents environmental gains, as private cars are no longer clogging our streets, but also serious health benefits. More than ever, people are recognising that a green economy is not only necessary to meet the demands of the future, but also means a better quality of life. But change will not happen on its own. It requires us to act. The time has come for a Green New Deal to invest in skills, green energy and infrastructure, as well as our telecoms network, and support a just transition to the industries of tomorrow. And I do welcome the announcement today that almost 200 companies are calling for the Prime Minister to launch a green recovery. It's businesses leading in these calls. The risk of scarring life opportunities during economic change is serious, as we have seen in the late 2000s, particularly amongst young people. Signs so far suggest that young people are more, much more likely to be impacted by the shutdown and tend to be employed in seriously restricted sectors, such as hospitality, tourism and retail. We must ensure that our young people have the skills required for the jobs of the future. Therefore, the Executive needs to urgently consider targeted support to assist young people into training or to secure employment. The Youth Employment Scheme, introduced by the former Employment and Learning Minister and my Alliance colleague, Dr Stephen Farry, MP, is a good example of this. So inclusiveness and engagement must be central in pursuing a just economic recovery. That brings me to the concept of a social partnership introduced by our proposed amendment. The social partnership approach has been the norm in many European countries for decades. It brings together government, businesses, workers, unions and the third sector to provide input and make decisions on key economic and social issues. In regards to the model, the International Labour Organization has noted that in engaging in dialogue, the social partners also fortify democratic governance, building 
vigorous and resilient labour market institutions and contribute to long-term social and economic stability and peace. In the UK, however, industrial relations between workers and businesses and government have been more adversarial in tone than in the rest of Europe, and decision-making has been more centralised. People have been continually told that, the work, uh, uh, that, that work is the root out of poverty, yet wage growth in recent times has failed to keep up with the cost of living increases. That has left many feeling powerless and forgotten in our economic system. In recent times, Wales, which has historically been scarred by industrial strife and economic decline, has taken steps towards introducing a statutory basis for social partnership. That includes placing a duty on public bodies to work in social partnership and to promote fair work, as well as make fair work central in public procurement. I believe this could provide us with a good model for change. Therefore, I hope that the Executive will seriously consider such a structural approach to rebuilding a fair and inclusive economy, safeguarding workers' rights and, indeed, restoring trust in government. And I do commend the Minister and our officials for the work done so far in relation to the Northern Ireland Engagement Forum on COVID-19. That has provided a good template for progress, and I do hope that that is something that we can continue. Before closing, I would also like to note another huge structural issue facing the future of our economy, in which there has been a worrying lack of local input, the eternal elephant in the room, Brexit. With the additional damage of COVID-19 and the need to respond to the health crisis, an extension to the Brexit transition period is clearly required. It is difficult to see how the capacity exists to prepare to implement the protocol in the time period given and to respond to COVID-19. The last thing we need as we try to chart our recovery are more barriers and disruption. In closing, I thank the relevant members for bringing this debate forward today. This crisis has helped us see more clearly than ever the economic and social issues that face our society and provide a juncture for a rethink. Going forward, given our limited resources in Northern Ireland, we also press for UK-wide commitment to rebuild a comprehensive welfare system to maintain good public services, not threadbare ones. This means, for example, a health service that has money and staffing to see routine patients in weeks, not years. It also means a social care system that values individuals and their rights, as well as care workers with a fair living wage and conditions. Just like there was a post-war consensus, I hope we can build a post-COVID consensus to properly engage people, businesses and others in the social and economic decisions that affect them, to invest in our public services and social security and build a fairer, greener economy. I am happy to support the motion, but I encourage members to support the amendment, which we believe gives more specific focus upon building an inclusive, just and green recovery. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I call Sinead McLaughlin, Deputy Chair of the Economy Committee. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak on behalf of the Committee for the Economy. This is a timely motion as the Committee received a briefing on this issue from the Irish Congress of Trade Unions at its last uh, week's meeting. While the Committee has not had an opportunity to agree a view on the motion, and therefore I will not be able to support the motion on the Committee's behalf, nonetheless, members are on record expressing the Committee's thanks and admiration for the contribution made by our frontline workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. It would be remiss of me not to use this opportunity to put on record again the Committee's deep gratitude for the Herculean efforts, efforts uh, that these heroes have made to benefit us all. Deputy Speaker, I am sure that all members would also echo that statement and sentiment. As have I indicated from the outset, the committee was briefed by ICTU and the Nevin Economic Research Institute last Wednesday about their vision for our economic recovery from the crisis. They too used the word just. Like the committee and all the other groups represented on it, ICTU warmly welcomed the establishment of the Labour Relations Agency Engagement Forum by the Economy Minister. This forum represents a unique approach to bringing together the public-private trade union sectors to advise the executive on its handling of the COVID-19 crisis, as well as offering suggestions for the recovery, the rebuilding phase uh, and that we are now entering into, and to which this motion refers, and the groups that it brings together to advise uh, the executive. The committee, like ICTU, believes that the forum 
has a role to play after the crisis as an advisory body to inform the executive around the recovery and the rebuilding of the economy. Indeed, ICTU suggested that the forum could perform a useful function advising the executive on the programme for government, for example, and could provide a place for social dialogue to consider solutions to problems facing the executive and wider society. ICTU suggested that its focus should be on the future of work, innovation, skills, productivity and a revision of our investment in economic development model. The committee has discussed the recovery and the rebuilding phase we are now entering into and the members agree that this tragedy offers us an opportunity to build in a way that recognises the mistakes of the past and does not repeat them, as well as a horizon scanning for the skills and industries that will allow us to create greater prosperity for our people. The committee agrees that the view, with the view that the current job retention scheme or for long should taper off in a way that allows employers to bring back workers in a phased or part-time basis initially. The committee makes, believes that the recovery is a time when we can look to ensure that workers, particularly young people, emerging into the workforce for the first time are properly skilled. They need skills that will give them opportunity to engage with the jobs that will be created and the sectors that will be established in the months and the years to come. Our young people in particular must leave school, training and further education with skills that are relevant to future jobs and industries. This requires a partnership between employers, schools, further education colleges and higher education institutions, as well as other training providers and of course the executive as a whole. Such industries would include those involved in decarbonisation and the development of a Green New Deal sectors and jobs. The committee also heard from Solis and Nilga last week. Members agreed with their analysis that for an economic prosperity going forward, we must pr prioritise the revival of our village, town and city centres. As we build skills for the future, we must ensure that we begin to get our economy moving again and to fund the issues that the motion under debate raises. The executive needs to provide support for these centres to reopen, uh, for our centres to reopen and abide by social distancing and other guidance. Such a revival would need to be supported by greater animation of these centres, as well as marketing and promotion around the shopping and using services locally. This stimulation of growth, and growth on a localised basis is essential for a balanced regional recovery and makes sense as part of a collaborative regional rebuilding plan in the committee's view. Small and micro businesses, as well as social enterprises and startups, have been the hardest hit by the lockdown. They are also the backbone of our local economy and need direct financial support from the executive. These sectors are generally not Invest NI client companies, however, they must be prioritised. The committee agreed that the, with Solis and Nilga's view that we need to provide incentives for people to require digital skills. Um, key to the working of this and uh, and any future crisis, reskilling and upskilling more likely to develop a more sustainable Could ask the member to order the close. base going forward. <clears throat> Councils have suggested to the committee that this effort should be supported by skills academies as well as the creation of innovative hubs. These will require a partnership with further and higher education training providers, better and clear careers. The member's time and skills is up. advice. Okay, thank you very much. I call Gary Middleton. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, obviously uh, as we look to recovery I think it's fair uh, and right that uh, first and foremost we think of all those who have passed and who have lost their lives uh, during this uh, crisis and uh, it's never easy looking towards the recovery stage. We're still dealing with uh, trying to keep people safe but we do uh, nonetheless need to work to try and get our economy uh, back up and running and to fit in with the new message of the Northern Ireland Executive as well in terms of staying home, staying uh, saving lives work um, safe and save lives as well. Uh, the number of deaths is now uh, over 500 and that's, that indeed is tragic. Uh, but we think of our NHS staff and our frontline workers uh, for the work that they have done to keep that number down. But also uh, the motion talks about our essential and our key workers. Uh, some of those workers who would never have felt uh, that they were key. Our shop workers, our delivery drivers, our cleaners, our postmen and women bin collectors, uh, lorry bus drivers, train drivers, pharmacy workers, there's many more uh, out there and we need to reflect in terms of how we uh, better value their work and I think there would be no greater honour as going forward uh, th that we review that and look at how we support them uh, and ensuring that they're very much part of the recovery phase 
as well. Uh, also, our community and voluntary uh, sectors and providers, uh, they've worked tirelessly uh, to ensure that our most vulnerable are protected. Again, they very much need to be part of the recovery phase, and I wouldn't like to think that going forward that they would be seen as an easy target in terms of making savings. I think that we need to look at how we utilise them in the best way possible going forward to ensure that we can get our, our, our economy back on track. Uh, the context of this discussion is indeed very worrying. We know that uh, our unemployment figures in Northern Ireland rose by almost 90% in April. And indeed, figures released just today uh, by Ulster University in terms of the economic impact uh, is very startling indeed. We know that it, it, it refers to uh, the economic impact. Uh, the total furloughed and laid off employees in Northern Ireland has been around 250,000. Now, that's a significant number. Within my own constituency, it talks of uh, almost 16,000. Those are staggering figures, and we know that the Minister uh, is doing all that she can to try and uh, address the situation, but she will need the support of not only uh, people within her own department who are doing a fantastic job at this minute in time, but all departments now need to uh, put politics aside and ensure that uh, we can get our economy uh, back up and running again. Uh, we do very much welcome all of the assistance which has been. We know the, the 280 million in terms of grants and ensuring businesses have been able to uh, oversee this difficult period. The furloughing um, scheme, again, vital in terms of support. Uh, but we do know that the part-time furlough scheme as we move into August is going to be very essential in terms of ensuring that our uh, hotels and, 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 and our industries, as they start to, to reopen again, uh, that they have the support to ensure they can meet their, their, their overheads. Uh, we need to work, as, as um, the committee has met in, in recent weeks, we need to ensure that we work with Nilga and Solace and our, our council chief executives. Again, they, they are going to be on the front line and are vital in terms of our economic recovery. Our councils have somewhat in recent years felt that they, they were uh, merely consultees. I think that we need to now see our councils more as partners. And some of the fantastic initiatives that we, we have seen announced by the executive, our city deals, they're going to be more important than ever uh, in terms of getting our economy uh, back up and running. Um, I just want to put on record, obviously, our thanks uh, to the Minister and to the Department uh, for all the work that they've done. It hasn't been easy. There hasn't been a blueprint. There hasn't been a manual to, to try and get uh, our economy back up and running again. But I am confident that if we all work together on this, uh, we can get to a point where uh, our economy is back thriving again. Uh, and one thing that I would like to say in, in closing is that I do welcome the commitment uh, by the Minister today in terms of uh, further indicative timings for our, our hotels. Uh, as a party, we have been at the forefront in fighting for businesses, and we do want to give as much clarity, but we always must be mindful of the fact that we are not out of this crisis as of yet. We need to listen to the medical advice and trust that uh, the decisions will be taken as soon as uh, possible and as soon as practicable. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I call John Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, can I thank the Chair of the Economic Committee for bringing this motion forward today? Um, naturally, I think myself and all of us would agree with the sentiments of the motion, um, the social economic equivalent of the middle of the stick, which is perfection for everyone, for our workers, for our families, for businesses, that everyone gets what they want. And sadly, sometimes that isn't always possible, but um, it is what we should always be desiring to achieve. I think for many of the businesses listening here today to this debate, if they are listening, they will hear much of it as being in the medium to long term about aspirations, about how we change, how we do things and how things look in the future. If I'm a, uh, an owner of a small business and I can't afford to feed my family and pay my staff, I'm worried about yesterday, today and tomorrow. Sadly, not about then. While desirable, I don't see it as essential, but we can get to that. Um, in terms of the motion, I want to place in record the Ulster Unionist Party's heartfelt thanks for the frontline workers who have continued to keep our health service going and functioning over the last two and a half um, pretty horrendous months, and also to the farmers, the hauliers, the food retailers, care workers, council employees, and the many other service providers who have never stopped a single minute throughout this entire pandemic. It is, as has been often said, the biggest um, health crisis of our lives, certainly of the NHS and the biggest worldwide pandemic since the Spanish flu of 1918. Um, and much of the economy has been put globally into cold storage, awaiting to come back out of that. Um, there's little doubt that uh, despite the unprecedented British government intervention since March, in particular Chancellor of Exchequer's job intervention scheme um, and the self-employment scheme, 
There have been widespread redundancies when big government um, uh, interventions and mechanisms, especially the furlough scheme, end later in the summer. Um, those who are on the Economy Committee will know that I have spoken at length, um, both there and the Ad Hoc Committee, to say that the Economic Recovery Plan should have begun immediately. Um, while it was a health crisis, it was quite quickly becoming the biggest economic crisis we have ever faced. And it is disappointing that we are now nine or ten weeks on and we still are just about bringing this here today and are only looking into the medium and long term. I think it would be much more important if we had of, um, been discussing that from the beginning. But we are we are, and whatever str strategy the executive brings forward, it needs to be radically redrawn from where it was before. The executive could learn a lot by looking at the Welsh model. The member's an extra minute. Thank you, and um, thank the member for his intervention. Um, absolutely. Um, those who have heard me speaking here before, have, I have highlighted that from the start. Back at the end of March, the Welsh Government intervened with over £100 million worth of intervention um, to give support to businesses that perhaps were unreached by the support that we have given here. And, look, I do accept the point um, um, that Mr Middleton made around the interventions that have been given already by the executive, but the fact is that out of the 100,000 plus businesses in Northern Ireland, the overwhelming majority have still received very little support, aside from um, the furloughing scheme, which has been hugely beneficial. So yes, there are grants in there of up to £100,000, which would be massive to some of our companies. Um, £10,000 to a single business owner can be quite a lot, but if you're employing 15 staff, it's a, it's a week's wages. So I think that there are things we could be doing in the here and now. And the member was right, I think he's left now, about how we pay for this. That is so important. Um, the fact of the matter is we need a complete reprioritisation of our budget and what it is that we spend. And that will require difficult decisions from ministers, from departments, to end pet projects and schemes that were desirable three months ago. They're no longer desirable. But yes, they are, but they're not essential. Business survival is essential. Families getting, get, having a job, you know, putting bread on the table is essential. And if that means a complete reprioritisation about what it is we do here and the money that we spend, funneling that into companies, giving them the opportunity to expand and to grow and to create the jobs that we need to make our economy grow. Uh, yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, would the member agree that the, the, the changes and the economic crisis that have been brought about by the COVID crisis will be surpassed if we do not address the climate crisis that is creeping upon us as well and the economic upheaval that that will bring and the change to our systems and our lifestyles and our business will be even more drastic than those we're currently experiencing through COVID? Thank you for the member's intervention. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely do. I think we all spoke in this chamber feels it months ago now when we had the discussion on, uh, on, on um, the climate emergency and the need to reprioritise our economy around that. And I think Northern Ireland can lead the way in the drive towards zero emissions without doubts. Um, and I think that is, has to form any part of our medium to long term economic strategy. But again, it goes back to my original point. There are companies that, that the families and the companies who are about to go under, while yes, they take that into consideration, they need some impetus now or some support now. So I think it's a combination of both short-term interventions and then looking at a medium to long-term strategy. Absolutely. I mean, the economy is everything. Um, while, again, this is a health crisis, the economy is everything. Without taxation, without a buoyant, stable economy and creating the money to pump into our vital NHS and our other public services, we have absolutely nothing. I mean, governments don't create jobs, businesses do. We might create the conditions whereby these companies can create the jobs, but ultimately it is down to um, the businesses to create these jobs and to further them. And I think while workers, yes, they, they want a better wage and they want better conditions, Northern Ireland companies on the mass look after their employee, the employees and the, the, the workers a lot more than I can say in other countries. And I think that we should be proud of the companies that we have here. Would the member draw us remarks to close? Absolutely everything we can. Um, there's so much we could speak in this, um, but ultimately as well, I'd like to see um, a Northern Ireland first approach to public sector procurement and channeling as much money from our public sector procurement scheme into given companies that are here now a lifeline as well. Thank you. I call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And um, the COVID 19 pandemic has affected everyone across Northern Ireland, and these few months have undoubtedly been very challenging and difficult for our economy. It is important to recognise and pay tribute to all of the key frontline workers alongside our National Health Service heroes. Key line workers have continued to work through this pandemic, taking personal risks and sacrifices, providing essential services, including those within our 
food supply chains, transport workers, pharmacists, carers, farmers, fishermen, other essential retail staff, waste collection operators, emergency services, postmen and postwomen, teachers and funeral directors, amongst the many others, who I believe deserve fair play and fair pay. I know the Economy Minister has recognised the significant challenges faced by local businesses, employers and employees, and has delivered and has helped deliver the various support measures, which have been a real lifeline with over 280 million being allocated through the 10K and 25K grant schemes in recent weeks. This alongside the various income support and furlough schemes from our UK government, we have, benefited, we have benefited from one of the best economic rescue packages in the world, which, being part of our United Kingdom, has been so crucial for short-term survival for so many people. With the challenges we have faced, now is the time for action to rebuild our economy. I very much welcome the, the Economy Minister's commitment towards restarting and rebuilding our economy, as announced on Friday, with the publication of charting a course for the economy, our first steps. The Chancellor's announcement on Friday around tailored adjustments to the UK government support measures also backed the reopening and kick-starting of our economy. While we must continue to be guided by the medical and scientific advice, there is a desire for clarity on the various phases of recovery. I welcome the latest announcements around the reopening of our non-food retail and believe there are further opportunities for other businesses to reopen in a safe and controlled way, including within our high streets, who will need support as they reopen their doors in a phased basis. Estate agents are an example of this, a sector who are keen to get going as interest rates as, sorry, as interest builds within the housing market including the handover of new homes where construction work has progressed, especially for those first-time buyers keen to get their new home. Buying and supporting local will be crucial for our recovery and for our economy to rebuild and get confidence again in our towns, cities and villages. Our councils, as already mentioned, must also step up and work in partnership with businesses and with central government. Our hospitality, retail, le leisure and tourism sectors will also need continued support on the road to recovery. There are real opportunities for these sectors, including for our local tourism product as it rebuilds and taps into the desire for domestic holidaying at home or the trendy name of staycations. The announcement today from the Minister to reopen our hotels, guest houses and caravan parks from the 20th of July is a welcome step forward. The focus on a regionally balanced economy in this motion is constructive, but we also have a responsibility to grow Northern Ireland's national and global competitiveness. We must build on a reputation for world-class and advanced technology, skills and manufacturing. We have seen recent investment in cyber security, and I believe there are further exciting opportunities to grow these sectors in partnership with our universities and regional colleges through innovation and development of new skills. Real opportunities are ahead and we must all play our part in supporting our recovery as Northern Ireland reopens. Thank you. I call Karen Mullen. I speak in favour of this motion and commend its sentiments. But just passing a motion in this assembly is not sufficient. We must convert its sentiments into practical strategy and implement that strategy in full. Therefore, I call on the Minister for Economy to instruct her officials to immediately begin the process of planning for a just recovery from both the health crisis that we are now experiencing and for the economic challenges that we will face at the other side of this pandemic. It's not sufficient to join the weekly Thursday night clap for our NHS workers if we do not commit to ensuring that their pay and conditions are equal with the care and diligence that we demand of our health service. No more should we feel that we can refer to certain grades of workers as low-skilled. Yes, low-paid, certainly, but low-skilled, no. 
These workers, be it home care workers, delivery drivers, shelf stackers, counter assistants, or any of, our, of the other multitude of workers that earned the description essential over the past number of months, must never be left behind again. They deserve to be treated with dignity and respect, and that dignity and respect must include receipt of living wage and proper protected working conditions. We must also strive to support and promote our SME and hospitality sectors who have taken a major hit to their viability in many cases. These are the backbone of our local economies and we must devise imaginative ways to ensure they, are, they not only survive but thrive. And finally, I believe that we all accept that this pandemic has changed the manner in which we will conduct almost every aspect of our lives going forward. As Vice Chair of the Education Committee, it would be remiss of me not to recognise the challenges ahead of our educators. Therefore, I call on the Minister for Education to re-evaluate the education model now in practice and to prepare and devise new and sensitive ways to progress our children through the different stages of primary and secondary education. The old way of doing education will not be compatible with the new conditions and requirements that will be expected from educators or students. We need to get this right. Remember the old saying, fail to prepare, prepare to fail, and we can't afford to fail our generation of future essential workers, leaders and educators. I call Christopher Stalford. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, in his remarks introducing his amendment, uh, Mr. Muir referred to economic orthodoxy being turned upon its head. Well, I think it was Baroness Thatcher of Kistevan who said that pennies don't fall from heaven, they have to be earned here on earth. And I think it's important in this debate that we are cognizant of that fact. As was said by my colleague from East Antrim, the economy is everything. It pays for our public services. It pays for our education. Speaking of which, I, I would like to put on record my thanks to uh, Ms Bannister, Mr Hay and Mr Jennings, the three school teachers that are having a, a role in the education of my children and are making such a valiant contribution, along with all of the public workers and key frontline staff. But we are now nearly nine weeks into this situation, and we have to be aware of the massive economic damage that our economy is sustaining. The scale of the interventions that have been made is absolutely unheard of in peacetime. The fact that such interventions can be made at all is proof, I believe, of just how much better off we are as part of the United Kingdom, that we have a government that can make such interventions and spend such money protecting businesses and the economy. But we also need to be honest I mentioned my children. My children will be spending a significant portion of their working life paying off the debt that these measures are accruing. And the longer the economy continues in lockdown, the longer all of our children will be spending their working lives paying this money back. Pennies don't fall from heaven. They have to be earned. And that's why I do welcome the actions that the economy minister has been engaging in during this crisis. I think that she has behaved responsibly and in a statesmanlike manner, balancing the need to protect public health insofar as is possible with the need to ensure that the economy can actually function again when these restrictive measures that are in place presently are lifted. Mention has been made of £280 million worth of grants and the furlough scheme. I hope that uh, Mr Muir won't think that I'm picking on him. 
but he also mentioned the post-war consensus that pertained between 1945 and 1979. I would remind him gently that Keynesian economics made the UK an economic basket case, and not for nothing were we referred to as the sick man of Europe during that period, but uh, I'll leave that there. That's for historians to argue. We cannot, we cannot keep the productive element of our economy, which pays for everything around us in lockdown any uh, single second longer than needs to be. And I therefore welcome the recent announcements that the Minister has made, particularly in relation to retail. I think other members are right, and I said this at the most recent meeting of the Economy Committee, I think other members are right in terms of one of the things that has changed as a consequence of this crisis is our perception of what is and is not important work has changed. My wife works in B&M on the Craigor Road, and I dare say that for the last nine weeks, people have thought that my wife's more important than I am. <laughs> and of course, I always think that. Of course, I always think that. Of course, I, I, I always think that. That's why I'm putting that, putting that in the hand sword for her to go and read it later. But I think people's priority our people's perception of what is and is not priority employment has changed, and I think that can only be welcomed as a good thing. I look forward to hearing from the Minister in some more detail the plans that the government have, or the executive have, to lead us out of lockdown and to get the engine of our economy ticking again. Thank you. The member has used a risky set of words which you may have to pay for later. And we now move on to Declan McLear. Thank you. Um, last can I call you? Um, I'd like to just take this uh, opportunity to, I suppose, pay tribute in my role as the Sinn Féin uh, spokesperson on agriculture and affairs to all of our farmers as frontline workers to, uh, producing our food throughout the course of this uh, pandemic. Um, we have around 25,000 farms here in the north, and uh, in terms of employment, employees supports the employment of 48,000 people right across the uh, food and drinks industry. So it's a huge, huge contribution to our economy with a 4.5 billion turnover last year. And you know it's a huge impact on the economy, but it's also it's also a way of life. And those of us who represent rural constituencies will know that that's a way of life for for many, many people and supports supports many, many people. Um, so we, it's a key employer uh, here. Um, our culture, it's, it's under pressure. Uh, there's very poor profit margins. The cost of production uh, exceeds the farm gate prices, and there's rising, rising input costs every single year. And indeed, during the course of the agriculture bill, uh, we're getting evidence recently. Some uh, researcher from Queen's uh, told us that without the direct payments, 30% of farms would immediately um, collapse. And, uh, and no doubt, since the COVID uh, pandemic came in, that figure will probably have increased. And indeed, um, the single farm payment accounts for over over 80% of income uh, of farmers. And farmers' income, even before the COVID pandemic, was increasing year on year. Last year, we've seen a 26% uh, decrease on uh, on their incomes. And that's very stark in some of the sectors. And if we take even the the ANC, the beef and beef and sheep farmers, you know. Their predicted income for this year is £10,000, uh, and as if they're lucky. And that's less. And I understand that, according to NISRA, how the weekly wage here is £535. Well, the beef and sheep farmers here in the north get less than the average weekly wage. So it's very stark. And they're, they're the producers uh, of, of, of our food. And um, so, um, the other, so okay, that's, the other point I want to make um, in terms of moving out of the economic recovery, it's so vital that those sectors, that the farming sector is protected. It needs to be looked at also uh, across the island. Any future economic recovery has to be look at farming and agriculture and food production across the island. Um, for example, we export about half a million sheep to the south and they export about half a million pigs to the north. And we export about 75% of our beef goes across the water to Britain. So unfettered access north, south, east and west is very, very important to us. But Brexit, of course, has thrown a bit of a um, spanner in the works as well, because the British market is so crucial to here. We export 87% of our agri-food, 
The British market is so crucial, but the failure of the British government to incorporate uh, minimum food standards in their bill uh, has opened the door to Britain importing cheap, low standard food imports into Britain and more than likely destroy the market for our farmers here. So we need to look throughout the rest of Ireland and beyond the EU and other places to try and find new markets. So future agriculture, uh, future recovery needs for us to look at our own indigenous uh, food security. And we can see the importance of that now with, this, with COVID, the whole volatility of the world stage, the way things can change on a global basis, basis, which underlines the importance for us to have our own secure food supply here in the north. And just before I conclude, um, um, I want to also say that within rural communities, isolation is a huge issue, absolutely huge issue. And you know, on a regional basis, and I'm surrounded here by a couple of Northwest MLAs in front of me and beside me here, the likes of the A5 and rural broadband is huge, hugely important in terms of connecting and reconnecting very isolated communities at this uh, particular time. I should also say, uh, just on the, um, on, the, on, the, on the funding stuff, uh, in terms of the future, what, what, what I'd want to see in the future in terms of communities, we want to see our TRIPSI budget given legal protection within the Department of Agriculture and Environment Rural Affairs. And of course, the lost funding from the Rural Development Programme. Like we're losing 80 million from our priority six of the Rural Development Programme as a result of Brexit. We need to see the UK Shared Prosperity Fund um, matching or replacing that lost EU funding because those projects are so crucial for community hubs, community support, village renewal. And we've seen how important all of that network has been during the course in responding to this crisis. So, in conclusion, I want to commend, I want to table, I table the motion, so uh, obviously support it. And, uh, and uh, looking into the future, uh, unfettered access east, west, Members north, time south, is up. and replacement of our lost EU funding. I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I can readily join in the saluting the um, frontline workers, which have been magnificent throughout this matter across our province. But I do have to say, when it comes to this motion as a roadmap to get us back on the path to economic prosperity, I despair of this motion. It's like any other socialist manifesto I've ever read. It's all about promises, hope, but no answers. Look at this motion. When it comes to restarting our economy, what does it say? Nothing. When it comes to support for business, what does it say? Nothing. When it comes to recognizing that job and wealth creation are key to job that wealth creation is key to job creation, what does it say? Nothing. When it comes to talking about economic prosperity, what does it say? Nothing. When it comes to Speaking about global competitiveness, nothing. When it comes to saying that we must move our economy from its super dependence on the public sector, nothing. When it comes to the whole issue of competitiveness, nothing to say. And of course, when it comes to who will pay, nothing to say. So this is a motion which, frankly, might be verbose in proclaiming virtuous things, but provides nothing in terms of taking us forward. And it's not much help by the fact that the only amendment permitted to it is one which simply adds a green flavour. There was another amendment which did at least talk about uh, the urgent need to restart economic activity, but it didn't merit attention on this order paper. So we're left with this uh, wish list uh, of a socialist nature which really doesn't take us very far. But I want to say, say this to the Minister. If she wants to do something green that's based not in sentiment but in manufacturing reality, then I direct her attention to supporting Right Bus. Because Right Bus in Balamina is moving forward as a world leader in terms of hydrogen-driven uh, buses uh, and vehicles. And if she really wants to create a hub in Northern Ireland 
for green, clean, safe energy and its use across our transportation sector, then instead of those who pontificate about the sentiment of the green economy, there's a reality of the green economy that could be tapped into and should be tapped into. And nothing would please me better than to see my constituency become the, a hydrogen hub for a built around right bus so that we could see the progression, so that Transwing could be supplied with hydrogen buses and all those things uh, could be advanced. A little economic forethought, a little economic reality would be a lot preferable to the sentiment that floats around in this motion and the amendment. Thank you. Oh, sorry. And I now call Matthew Toole, who will have the remaining four minutes of this debate with or without interventions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I will, um, I will be um, concise. I rise to support the motion and the amendment, although, um, and at the risk of sounding too much like I agree with the previous speaker, which wouldn't do at all, um, it is... Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it is difficult to find all that much to disagree with in either the motion or the amendment. Nevertheless, I and my party will be supporting them. I think the urgent thing is that we move on from the sentiment in these motions into hard, practical policy. Mr Deputy Speaker, the COVID crisis has illustrated an enormous number of things to us that were probably known before but have become starkly obvious in the last three months. Lots of people have talked about the importance of key workers. That is absolutely true, and Mr Stolford put it very well when he talked about his wife's job. But the absolute harsh reality is that what the COVID crisis will do in the next few months is that it will underline long-term structural weaknesses that have afflicted this economy for not just months, but years and generations. And I'm afraid it's no good parties from different parts of this House who have presided over the repetition of some of the same policies um, lamenting the continuation of those structural challenges. We need hard action and practical policy to change them. In 1848, which I'm sure historians among us will know was the year of multiple revolutions in Europe, it was described famously as the year, as the turning point of history when history failed to turn. Um, let's hope that 2020 is not the turning point when history uh, fails to turn, at least in terms of Northern Ireland. I talked about the long-term structural challenges our economy faces. Well, what are they? We have, we, are, uh, we have been for a very long time the most unproductive part uh, of these islands. This is the most unproductive economy in these islands. And while I respect um, unionist members talking about the role the UK Exchequer has played in helping businesses, and I don't deny that, my God, who could? Businesses that have been in receipt of Treasury funding are, of course, gr uh, grateful uh, for not having gone out of business. I would say that as a long-term economic strategy, sheer supplication and sheer saying that all we can do is rely on uh, money from the UK Exchequer is not a sensible long-term strategy, which is why I agree uh, with, actually with Kiva Archibald, and I've been urging her colleague, the Finance Minister, to progress ideas for a long-term fiscal commission, to look at how we raise revenue here, raise revenue to pay for public services, and I say that as someone who's proudly a member of a social democratic centre-left party. We need to raise revenue in Northern Ireland, and we need to direct that revenue towards the urgent priorities that we all can agree on. We can all agree that we have long-term underinvestment in our infrastructure. We can all agree that we need to transition to a greener, lower carbon economy. It would be much better for us if we were able to raise the revenue and decide on those priorities ourselves here, but we still have yet to have, I'm afraid, either a short or a long-term economic recovery strategy for the executive, and we yet to have a, an agreed, updated set of programme for government targets. So, what do we need? We need a serious set of long-term joined up economic and fiscal policies. We don't need, with respect, um, uh, pop-up policies like the announcement around hotels being able to open but without a date of them booking. I don't mean to pick on one particular issue, but it does highlight a, a, a problem that has been endemic to governance in this place for the last number of years, which is unrelated pop-up policy, things that don't really make a lot of sense uh, as part of a joined up picture, but kind of work because a particular lobby group has asked for them. So. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm rapidly approaching the end of my four minutes. I could go on and on, and the reason I could go on and on is that both the motion and the amendment are drawn very wide, and it's hard to agree or disagree with them. So while I will support them, I will say that 
by far the most important thing is that we move urgently and rapidly to agreeing a set of priorities which allows us to deliver the kind of just economic recovery and lower carbon economy that we clearly all want. And I call on the Minister for the Economy, Mrs Diane Dawes, to respond to the debate and you will have up to 15 minutes. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, and to you and the proposer of the motion, my apologies that I was a couple of minutes late at the start. Um, events moved a lot quicker in the Chamber today than I had anticipated, so my apologies. Um, COVID-19 has had an unprecedented impact on our economy and society, and I have listened with interest to members' contributions today. Can I reassure um, the member for East Antrim that just because this is the first time that we have had the opportunity to debate this in the Chamber to today, my department has been working on this from the start. Of course, today our thoughts are with the families and communities of those uh, who have suffered pain and loss. And I think it is right to recognise those who have been on the front line during this time. This cuts across the public and private sector. As well as the heroic work of our NHS, we would not have been able to cope without the work of hauliers, retail workers, and other key frontline staff. This crisis has shown how essential their work is. This motion calls on us to protect the vulnerable through an impending recession. I want to be clear. Economists uh, will define what is and what is not a recession, but those who have already lost their jobs will not need an economist to tell them about the state of the economy. Some six years of progress on jobs was lost when the Northern Ireland claimant count increased by 26,500 people in a single month. Unfortunately, we can expect unemployment to increase again the Bank of England has forecast a UK-wide unemployment rate increase of around five percentage points for the second quarter of 2020, when compared uh, to the unemployment rate just before the outbreak. For Northern Ireland, this could mean an increase of around 50,000, around double the rise seen in the latest claimant count figures. Supporting the vulnerable, those on low incomes, those who have already lost their jobs is not future work. It is for the here and now. The first step in protecting the most vulnerable is in safely reopening our economy so that those who have lost jobs can seek new employment and to limit the number who become unemployed. Construction, manufacturing and retail are opening. Today's approach to hotels, bed and breakfasts, caravans and self-catering accommodation is a further step, but we must move safely in line with the medical and scientific advice. I have been impressed by these sectors and how they've adapted. Significant changes have been made to, work, uh, norm to make sure that workers uh, are safe at work. We must also move beyond the reopening of our economy to planning for the future of our economy. A strong economy benefits everyone in our society. I value economic growth because I am aware of what the alternative is. We have lived through recessions, have seen how unemployment impacts physical and mental health, has seen closed shops and factories in local towns. No one wants to return to that. There are significant challenges in building a stronger economy. The world has changed very rapidly. We cannot say with any authority what it will look like in a year's time. As an economy, we rely on consumer spending. If people have more limited opportunities to spend money in their local shops and restaurants, this limits the ability of retail and hospitality here to continue to operate. The tourism sector has been perhaps the hardest hit by the present crisis and by the long-term impact on travel. While many businesses in these sectors have adapted, it is likely that growth will be a difficult to achieve even in the medium term. This motion calls for a, transition, for a just transition to an economy centred on more people working in higher paying jobs. 
To achieve this, we will need to focus on sectors that can deliver higher paying jobs. Looking to the future, I think it is likely to be the potential for growth in life and health sciences. Similarly, the digital sector is likely to continue to grow. And as uh, my colleague from North Down indicated, the good news on cybersecurity jobs uh, in Belfast recently um, not only shows that Northern Ireland uh, is out in front in terms of training, education in these sectors, but that it can compete and is competitive on a global scale. Our advanced manufacturing se sector also has strong potential. And tourism has been one of our success stories over recent years, and one that I am determined to support as they get back on their feet. We live in... Yes, I, I will. So to the Minister for giving way. I know she's working on a tourism uh, recovery plan. I just wonder if she could say more about the short term for the tourism sector. It would appear very unlikely that e this year, possibly next, that there will be any close, anywhere close to the, to the kinds of markets that we had access to. Um, which markets for this summer um, and indeed the rest of the year um, is Tourism NI prioritising? And I thank the member uh, for his intervention. Um, and yes, of course, tourism, we are currently working um, with uh, our steering group with all of the, the different uh, aspects of that sector involved in it. Um, it is absolutely clear to us um, that in the immediate future, this will be the domestic market um, within these islands, the British Isles, um, that will provide us uh, with much of our tourism activity. And for reference for this uh, house, I spoke to uh, North American tour operators last week uh, who indicated that there is still a strong desire to visit Northern Ireland and many of the groups uh, that they had booked for this year have rebooked uh, for uh, the next uh, season. So I think we will have to rely on the, the, the market uh, at home, um, but I think that we are and will continue uh, to be attractive. Uh, in uh, the other markets, particularly the North American market. Um, we live in a society where inequality and poverty are persistent problems. We see that so far this crisis has impacted most on those on low incomes and on young people. The opportunities that are likely to come in the years ahead will be disproportionately in sectors where specific skills are required. And so we must ensure that those who lose jobs in other sectors are given the support they need to upskill in areas where there is demand. I have been struck over the last number of months by the changes in our environment. Fewer people driving to work, more people out cycling or walking. These are positive changes, and I think that many people have reflected um, that this uh, could uh, reshape how we appreciate our environment and protect against climate change. The proposer of the motion advocates a, a, deal, a new deal, uh, but economic recovery, I stress, must be sustainable and provide growth opportunities for the private sector. In Northern Ireland, we have already been meeting some of our targets in relation uh, to uh, our energy uh, targets. We have led the way in developing a renewable electricity to meet the executive's 40% target. This success has helped to develop a low carbon and renewable energy economy made up of 3,500 businesses, 5,500 jobs, and 269 million worth of exports. Minister we need Kinway. to further develop this part of the economy. Yes, I will. I'm very grateful to the Minister for giving way. For some members of this House, the idea of a command economy might be something that is, that is appealing. But the truth of the matter is that on, only through having a free economy that's generating wealth can any of the aims, lofty as they are, contained in this motion be achieved. Would the Minister agree with me on that? We need our economy uh, to function in order to provide for our public services and in order to help us to protect the most vulnerable. So I am absolutely behind businesses who seek to create wealth opportunity uh, for people. Uh, and uh, I think that this is an appropriate way for uh, this uh, house to go. Can I also uh, reassure the member for North Antrim 
um, that I have already been speaking uh, to Right Bus. And uh, just this week, um, I will convene a meeting between Right Bus, my department officials, and Invest Northern Ireland to investigate how Northern Ireland can benefit uh, from greater job opportunities and uh, using the technology and research that is available in the North Antrim area uh, to promote the hydrogen project. And I hope that we will be able to make progress on that. Um, as Minister for the Economy, since the crisis first struck, I have been aware that while it was since primarily a health crisis, it was always going to become a grave economic crisis. And throughout, I have ensured that my department and arm's length bodies are working to support business in any way that we can. That has, as some colleagues have referenced, included a social partnership with the Engagement Forum, which was asked to do two specific tasks, to look at the essential workers list and to give safety advice. And I would also um, um, reference the, the chair, the deputy chair of the Economy Committee um, to say that um, on the programme for government, of course, it is the responsibility of the First and Deputy First Minister, not just to reference something like the Engagement Forum, but to consult very far and wide on this particular and very important piece uh, of programming. The Department has also moved uh, to bring unprecedented levels of support to businesses right across Northern Ireland. The business grant schemes were designed to protect jobs, prevent business closure and promote economic recovery. I welcome the uptake of those schemes. We have to date of issued over 22,000 payments through the 10,000 uh, grant scheme, representing over 220 million of support. There have been 2,600 payments made through the 25,000 grant scheme, representing 65 million of support to businesses in retail, hospitality, tourism and leisure. And of course, the extension of the rates relief uh, to these sectors for the years and to everyone for the first four months uh, of the rates year uh, is an enormous uh, value uh, to businesses um, as they try to plot a way forward. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give away because I'm rapidly running out of time and there's other things that I need to get through. So, along with uh, those supports that are there at a national level, the job retention scheme, the self-employment scheme, the access to finance schemes, these have been vital in keeping um, business going. On tourism, I've established uh, the Tourism Recovery Steering Group, which brings together the private and public sectors to plan for recovery. This group, supported by uh, Tourism NI, will play a key role as government and industry work together to help our tourism and hospitality sector find its way back to full potential. There has been some discussion of the need to invest in infrastructure to rebuild our economy. The past few months have shown us that broadband infrastructure is a vital part of our economy. We will not be able to build a regionally balanced economy without investment in broadband. Project Stratum seeks to use 165 million uh, of funding available from the confidence and supply deal to increase uh, and, and improve broadband services across primarily rural areas of Northern Ireland. The target intervention area consists of 79,000 premises. 97% of those are rural. The contract award is expected in September 2020 with a full deployment uh, in March. This is the type of long-term infrastructure project that we will need to ensure that businesses can prosper anywhere in Northern Ireland. On employment legislation, I've introduced legislation to ensure that workers who are prevented from taking their annual leave because of the pandemic can carry over some of that leave into the next two years. I have also, in conjunction with the Minister for Communities, introduced legislation to ensure that furloughed workers who are entitled to statutory family-related payments will not lose out. This goes together with wider plans I have on ensuring our employment legislation gives people the support they need. For example, I recently announced my intention to consult on proposals 
to put in place provision for parental bereavement leave and pay. This has been an unprecedented few months. I believe we have responded as as quickly as possible and delivered things that uh, uh, that would have been thought impossible in normal times. But there is more to do. And I look forward to setting out a long-term economic strategy and working with this House to ensure that families and jobs in Northern Ireland are our highest and utmost priority. Thank you. And I call John Blair to wind on the amendment, and you'll have up to five minutes. Deputy Speaker, thank you. Can I thank the Minister for that previous statement and the proposers of the original motion for accepting the amendment put forward by Andrew Muir and myself? Um, of course, I, int- I thought originally I was coming to respond to the amendment only. Um, I should be able to make some comments uh, in response to remarks made. Before I do so, Deputy Speaker, I should have time to make a few comments of my own, um, starting with adding to the thanks paid to our uh, frontline workers. I am hopeful that the debate today and the sentiments expressed will offer them some reassurance that we are looking to safeguard those services um, that those people provide for the future as we begin to look for recovery and the necessary societal change. Deputy Speaker, there will be many lessons learned, and some of them have been referenced already today, from the COVID period. We will, I am sure, reflect for some time on the human loss, the changes in our methods of governance, and of course the time when our interaction with others was seemingly stopped completely. Uh, however, there are positives even in these darkest of times to be taken from what we have learned thus far. And I want to mention in particular the collaborative working which has taken place in government and in government's respective departments. Hopefully the Minister will take back to her officials, as I've said here and with regard to other, our sincere thanks for the work done in a never changing environment. Um, It would be remiss of me uh, not to mention also, Deputy Speaker, the most outstanding community reaction that there has been to assist those most in need, and we have seen that in every locality. And I want to draw down two examples which relate to how we can better facilitate the just and economic recovery, which is uh, the focus of the motion. Firstly, the collaborative approach which I mentioned, which has been beneficial at this time of crisis, should become the working model for the future. It is essential that government, regional, national and local, works together with communities to ensure mutual understanding of challenges and to shape solutions. And that in itself might help embrace that community spirit demonstrated so that those people who have made that huge effort in recent times can feed in to the near future, the medium future and the longer term future. Also, uh, the Green New Deal, which has been spoken about today, Deputy Speaker, isn't merely aspirational. It's a commitment in a document called New Decade, New Approach which made that document more attractive for some of us to be part of that government. So that's about uh, making sure we make and meet a commitment and nothing more than that. I will now turn to... to yeah. I wonder if the member would agree with me that um, the commitments outlined in the European Commission to building a, uh, a, a kind of EU-wide Green New Deal approach offer some opportunity for the Northern Ireland institutions to, to look at how we could be a part of that specifically in relation to um, the protocol? The members an extra minute. Agree totally, uh, Deputy Speaker. Is a matter that should be considered going forward by all of us, but specifically by the, by the Northern Ireland exam, uh, Executive. Uh, that that Green New Deal will bring with it, by the way, as well, Deputy Speaker, economic benefits to exploring, to exploring and developing that circular economy. It will require new expertise. It will present opportunities for new learning experiences. Um, and in addition, it will bring opportunities to allow individuals to develop their own skills and as well as new skills to help in providing this greener and cleaner future. I will turn now to, to the comments made, Deputy Speaker in the Chamber. I'm very pleased that most of them, I think with, with one notable exception, were wholly supportive of the uh, proposal and the amendment. Sinead McLaughlin mentioned uh, that, that need for social dialogue, which I referenced there a moment ago. Gary Middleton spoke uh, very clearly about our need to protect the vulnerable. Uh, John Stewart referenced to some extent small businesses and the challenges that will exist on that going forward. Gordon Dunn mentioned the rescue packages that are already in the place. Um, Christopher Stallford mentioned also and paid tribute to government for, for the measures that are there. Of course, didn't rule out that we have to look at exploring new measures as well. Declan McAleer, who is no longer in the chamber, mentioned ag- the agriculture uh, sector challenge, and I will, through the DERA committee, explore that with Declan and others. 
Um, Matthew O'Toole also, in, in closing remarks, mentioned support for, for the motion, which is very welcome. Um, but I just repeat again, in, in reference to Mr. Alistair's comments, and I really want to stress, I'm not averse at all to explore um, opportunities at Wright Bus or anywhere else, because some of us aren't afraid of referencing aspiration at the same time as trying to deal with desperation, desperation or deprivation. Th those things are not mutually exclusive. It's perfectly uh, doable to work on all of those matters at one time. Um, I think all of this can be done. The member for Given Way. Would the member agree with me that we need to build back better and the time is now for the executive to bring forward a Green New Deal for Northern Ireland to decarbonise, reboot our commodity, economy, create jobs, improve our health, protect our environment and ultimately save our planet? Not in the future, but that needs to be done now. I do agree, Deputy Speaker, and that would be meeting that commitment that I mentioned a moment ago that, that's in a new decade, new approach document. Um, all of the... Co Thank the member for giving away. Um, I think 90 per cent of the, the member's amendment is, is perfectly fine, but would he share the concern of myself and many trade unions that the social partnership approach uh, in the south of Ireland in particular actually has led to the, the, the increased inequality um, in, in the wealth gap uh, as well in particular? I think, Deputy Speaker, uh, that that's, makes it all the more important that, that we um, examine that pathway forward at all levels of government. Can the member draws remarks to close? Uh, national, regional and local. Uh, all, all of these uh, sentiments that have been expressed, uh, certainly those in support of the motion and the amendment, Deputy Speaker, uh, can be done in the spirit of the motion. Uh, an emotion involving our people, providing for our people, and protecting our people. The member's time is up. One of the of recovery, Deputy Speaker, is the strength of the, all of us. The member's time to work is together. up. And I call Colin Gildenew to uh, wind and conclude the debate on the substantive motion. You'll have ten minutes. Um, I suppose I want to start out just by uh, touching back on, on, on where we started out this morning, a debate about the murder of George Floyd and the racism that was inherent within that. But I also want to point out that it's not just racism who people who suffer disadvantage to that level are struggling with. It's often rooted in inequality as well. Inequality of circumstance, inequality of opportunity and inequality of outcome right across the system. And this inequality bleeds into economic systems across the world. It curtails them, it holds them back, it stops them from building balanced economies, as we have heard mentioned here today. Throughout COVID-19, it is those that we have in the past have been referred to as low-skilled or non-essential workers who have actually now are on the front line in, in our response to COVID-19. Kahimaj Luak Nahibriha Ahinch Nila Toran San Kaicha Aktri Fakor Agus Kunyalaka Ibra Akoisanch Nimor Do Sha Ave Markuj De Ian Plan Chirna. In any economic strategy plan, their value must be recognised not through platitudes, but by paying our workers decent wages and protecting working conditions for those workers. I will. Does the member believe on an, uh, an, uh, an equal society and do you believe that we need sub-regional balance put into our economy as we emerge from lockdown? Derry and the North West has the highest levels of unemployment in any other region within the United Kingdom and we are consistently the lowest in terms of Invest NI for attracting jobs. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Thank you. I agree with the member on that and I will address that, that very issue within my remarks. Um, the economic strategy plan must include equality in infrastructure provision, in particular the provision of broadband in rural communities, and I welcome the Minister's uh, news on, on that in relation to the... I do have a slight concern in that the figure of 79,000 homes or premises were mentioned, and from meetings I've been involved in previously, I was of the understanding that it was over 100,000 premises, and I would have a fear that some of the worst provided for premises will still fall through that net, but that's work for, for a future day with the Minister. Project Stratum must proceed as soon as possible so that students, farmers, businesses and entrepreneurs in the far reaches of Fermanagh, Tyrone and Mid-Ulster have the same opportunities to grow and to succeed. Their success is vital to sustaining our rural communities in a balanced way. To falsa le corriv na kinchi fuin skol leas ek kolista magai agus na city deals leshin wenu sa region ir huskiart a chorin a kiart. Kahi and plan stretches gielakrak 
Lanstan or in Doi, Shaw a Corohus, Chirlak, Agus Regionic, a Croyler, and Capo Policy. The decisions on the medical school at McGee and City Deals are welcome for steps in redressing the historic underinvestment in the northwest region and west of the ban more generally. The economic strategy plan must continue along these lines with geographical and regional balance at the core of all policy making decisions. Small business, and I will declare that in my own interest in terms of the, most of my adult life I have either been very much involved with running or, or owning small business, but small businesses employ huge amounts of our population here. They are responsible for huge amounts of innovation, and in the Mid Ulster and Tyrone areas in particular, engineering and food processing companies are the economic driver for prosperity in our regions. Those businesses must be assisted with financial and other support if they are to survive in the expected economic downturn, and certainly those are some very worrying figures that the Minister has shared with us today. For example, small and social enterprises must be supported in their efforts to access public contracts, and we should look at uh, encouraging social value clauses within public procurement to support regional development and those smaller businesses. The Rebalancing the Economy 2019 report revealed that only 4% of the North's social enterprises are currently located in Fermanagh and Tyrone. Given that social economy has a track record of delivering social value and providing sustainable jobs, it is important that we see this sector delivering more of these benefits in Fermanagh, Tyrone and all areas west of the van. We also need to look at some of the other inequalities in the North and across other, other areas, but in particular in the North. Women here in the North make up more than 51% of the population, yet only 30% of women are self-employed. They represent 82% of all, all part-time workers, and 52% of women are unemployed. Women still face gender gaps in pay, higher levels of part-time work, and a concentration of employment in lower-paying sectors such as caring, cleaning, and hospitality. Rural women are even worse off due to the centralisation of services and opportunities, and with only 3% of government funding for women's groups going to rural women, they are undeserved, underserved and neglected. We also need to look at the issue of working carers in order to build a balanced and sustainable economy. Strong economies have come to realise the value of supporting their carers in their workforce. Germany have recently brought in laws which will promote uh, the rights of workers to take time off for carrying responsibilities and to protect their, their, their career progression and promotion. And we also need to look at that sector of our economy. As Chair of the Health Committee, I understand the pressures facing our health and social care sector. As the COVID-19 pandemic unfolded across our communities, we saw the consequences of 10 years of Tory austerity with a lack of even the most basic protection equipment available for those frontline workers, which many of you have referenced here today, and rightly so. In the aftermath of this crisis, it is expected that areas of high deprivation across the North will have suffered disproportionately. According to the Office of National Statistics, patterns of death from COVID-19 are corresponding with patterns of deprivation, with deaths in more deprived communities more than double those in the least deprived. And that is a scandal, members. And the aftermath of this emergency and this crisis, we will need to examine that and to see how we can prevent that from ever occurring again. Health inequalities here in the North need to be addressed. We must urgently address the inequality that caused the life expectancy of a child born in the North here in 2017 to be 1.6 years lower than the same child born in the South. We must try to understand why suicide rates are three and a half times higher in areas of high deprivation and why drug-related and alcohol-specific mortality is four times higher in our more depraved communities. We need to begin to tackle these stark inequalities, not only because they are an injustice in themselves, but also to build a sustainable economy. Austerity is not the way forward. It has caused enough un unnecessary suffering to so many. Our economic recovery strategy must be one that invests in our public sector, in all our communities, and in all our people. I note and I accept as he, he can give a valid opinion on, on austerity, but to say it was the sole reason why the health service is in crisis, I, I do not accept. And would he accept that a previous Minister of Health, who sits in his benches, was warned at one point to stock up on PPE and did not take that advice? 
I, I would ask, the, would, 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 would the, the member accept that his own Minister of Health in this chamber not very long ago stated that the, the health system had been under invested in for a period of 10 years, which corresponds almost exactly with Tory austerity. And that is why we have seen a year-on-year -year reduction in real terms in spend within, within that sector. And these, 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 are, these are issues that must be addressed going forward. Cahi or stretches China I a horch or in Bachtanak, Agus Nanyarianus, a cohire egorum slancha, Cahi Muni with slancha, Idigus, Agus Gilana, Titiact, Agus Kruhi, Fostiacra, Ave Marcuj, then stretches. Our economic recovery strategy must begin to earnestly tackle deprivation and inequality, particularly inequalities in health. The strategy must include investment in health, education and skills, housing and creation. Members, it's my belief that we need to recognise that there are many people out there who are trying to play against a rigged deck. Many years ago in my town in Dragano, not many years ago actually, a few years ago, there was a large housing estate in our town out of which not one child passed the 11 plus. Now no one in this house can convince me that there's not a single child in a massive estate that's intelligent enough that is structural oppression and structural disadvantage there in, in the system, and we need to tackle that to ensure we have a better way of going forward. We've heard a lot of talk in recent times about returning to normality, about returning to or the new normal. What I would say as members, we need to now the member start draws to work together. Close. Yeah, we need to start to work together to see how we make and create a better normal. I support the motion and reiterate our support for the amendment to the motion. Members, the question is that the amendment standing in the names of Andrew Muir and John Blair be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that the motion as amended be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. no. I think the eyes have it. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. The eyes have it. That then leads to item number four in the order of the amendment. The question is that the assembly do now adjourn. The assembly is adjourned. The assembly is adjourned. I have stated that before you raised your point of order. And you may t take an opportunity. The assembly is adjourned. <laughs>